Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. We have uh, Community Matters today, and uh, we're going to talk with Bob Toyofuku, who is the uh, founder and CEO and uh, chief honcho. Can I say that uh, at no, Pacific it's Law? It's Pacific Law Institute. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking today about you know uh, we'd like to we'd like to get to know what it's doing. We'd like to get to know some of the programs that you have done, will do, and how they affect the um, you know, members of the bar and the members of the public. Welcome to the show, Bob. Thank you very much, Jay. My pleasure. So let's talk about you first, because I mean, I, I know you since the early 70s and you actually haven't changed. You have that same style, that same you know, disposition that you did way, way back then and all the things you've done since. You know, you've practiced law, you've done lobbying, you've, you've, you've done a lot of CLE. In fact, in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, you were the major source of uh, continuing legal education for the whole Bar Association. You had a magic, you know, the, the magic touch. But can you talk about, you know, where you are now, where, you, where you're going with Pacific Law Institute? Well, you know, Jay, in the last uh, five years or so, uh, or maybe a little more, uh, I have been so busy uh, at the legislature in government affairs and lobbying that I haven't had much of a chance to design and put on different continuing legal education seminars, except for the trainings I do every year for the Court Annex Arbitration Program. And of course, you know that in September, we did one live virtually with you, which was very, very successful. We had more uh, attendees uh, at that seminar and the two replays than we have ever had doing it in person. We ended up, Jay, with 445 people, attorneys, arbitrators, logging in to uh, uh, watch the program. So that was very satisfying for me. But it was a I very have... good program, Bob. It oh, was really you. excellent. It was. Uh, it was engaging, it was interesting, and it taught the lawyers and arbitrators who were watching, um, you know, how things had changed and how they could catch up on, on, on the various dynamics that were going on about COVID. You know, that's the first virtual type seminar I've ever done. And I have always thought about doing webinar type seminars, videotaping the speakers and then playing it on a website somewhere and never did get around to it. And uh, hooking up with you and ThinkTech really energized me about doing more programs because um, it, it really takes, out, takes away a lot of the administrative, I mean, the functional things that you need to do. Rent a place at the, a hotel, set that up, send out the brochures, everything is changed with technology. So, you know, in the past year, I've done hundreds of continuing legal education seminars, and I have done different types of seminars as well, although using primarily lawyers or legislators. So since we did this uh, arbitration training, uh, it got me, well, can I use the word energized? And so I am going to do a uh, continuing legal education seminar in December with you on legal ethics. And the, the Supreme Court rules require that all attorneys that are licensed and active get three continuing legal education credits, CLE credits every year. And one of those credits every three years must be in ethics or professional responsibility. So I decided to at least put on a course in December in case certain attorneys do not have that one credit of legal ethics. So that's gonna be with ThinkTech on uh, December 11. And then moving forward, Jay, uh, you know that I am planning to do a, a course for the public, really, uh, not just for lawyers, uh, on how to 
access and lobby at the 2021 legislative session. The Capitol is still closed. It's unclear at this moment how they are going to conduct the session. Uh, is the timetable going to be changed? Uh, how are we going to testify? Is it all going to be virtual? And how is that going to be handled? Is there going to be a time limit? If we do want to meet personally with any legislator, can we do that? You know, make an appointment ahead of time. Uh, do we have to be cleared before we go to the Capitol? There's so many questions. So probably in early January, uh, that's scheduled with you, hopefully somewhere around January 8th or so. And I have three legislators, uh, two from the House, one from the Senate, and uh, I'm waiting for the Ways and Means Chair to uh, call me to see if he's available to participate. And I have the Speaker of the House and the Senate of the President of the Senate to make some introductory remarks. Well, you know, just like the uh, ar arbitrator program that you did a few weeks ago, um, that you know that that has to wrap around. I'm sure it will wrap around the possibility of a virtual session and therefore virtual testimony and therefore virtual lobbying. I can easily see a situation where you call up a legislator and say, I'm a lobbyist. I, I would like to uh, talk to you about a given bill. Let's make a Zoom meeting and we'll have our discussion. And you know, I don't think people have done that up to this point, but that, that, that does present itself. It certainly has, has swept through the arbitration proceedings um, and now I, I expect it may sweep through the legislative proceedings just the same way. Oh, yes. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I had mentioned to certain legislators several years ago, let's see, seven years ago, is that because the neighbor island uh, uh, individuals who want to testify, you know, they have to fly into Honolulu. And that's costly. It takes time. They have to wait around. And when I was in Alaska seven years ago, I visited the state capitol in Juneau and they had a system, not Zoom and not video, but audio. So somebody from Fairbanks, which is, you know, like, I don't know how many hours away, you know, either by car or plane, uh, they could call in at a certain time. And so I talked to certain legislators about thinking about setting something like that up for the neighbor islands. And, and not only neighbor islands, somebody from Waianae who can't get in very easily, they're not in central Honolulu, uh, can call in. So anyway, long story short, now with uh, the pandemic and the Capitol being closed, there is no choice but to do it either audio or video by Zoom or some other platform. So that's gonna be um, I think the standard. Yeah, and you know, just as it happens in the legislature, there's also an issue about all these courts and boards and commissions and committees and what have you all over state government, uh, you know, which, which call for participation, presence, testimony. And I remember I served on a couple of boards that were in the Big Island and the whole troop would get on a plane in the morning from o Oahu fly over to the big island and then fly back. It was a huge waste of money. <clears throat> and, uh, and they did not have either A, the technology, uh, you know, or bring people together by electronic means, nor was the statute ready for them uh, on, on sunshine. It wasn't clear that how to do that on sunshine. How to, it may require further legislation to clear this up in terms of commissions and, and boards and committees and the yep. like that otherwise are required to comply with sunshine. But I suggest to you, Bob, it isn't only the inner workings of the legislature that, you know, are in a, 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 tr a transition uh, over COVID. It's the whole state government and city government that's going to have to, that will probably benefit by uh, using Zoom. Oh, absolutely. And Jay, after we did the uh, uh, arbitration seminar, uh, uh, People, uh, attorneys talked to me and said, you know, it's going to change legal practice as well, because 
instead of flying to say Los Angeles to take a deposition, they're going to do it by Zoom. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's going to save money and it's going to save time. And I think it will be just as effective. The other area that I think more and more organizations in the health area are looking uh, at is uh, telemedicine, telehealth. Uh, we have looked at that for years here uh, because of the neighbor islands. And uh, I think now uh, it, it will expand. Uh, you know, they, you have to have certain protocols in place, but then I think it will definitely uh, uh, start to take off. Yeah, and, and these things will, <clears throat> they will continue after COVID is, uh, is, is reduced. Um, I mean, even now you go to HPH or Kaiser or Queens and, um, you know, that you can have telemedicine. It's, it's limited, but you can have telemedicine. I, and I agree with you as time goes forward and oh, you yeah. comply with the protocols and, and they develop systems and best practices, we're going to do more and more medicine, more and more personal medicine, um, seeing doctors and the like electronically. Oh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, and, you know. All the records and everything now are all done electronically. Yeah. So yeah. you know, it's just a matter of time before you prefer perfect certain things and and move forward uh, uh, using technology. So uh, but, you know, yeah, I think it, I think uh, this is the right time. This is a perfect inflection point uh, for Pacific Law Institute. You know, it's very important that lawyers and all licensed professionals stay current on their topics. You know, I think uh, for a long time, we, we, it wasn't required. Um, and now it's required and it, that's a good thing. And you wanna know when you go see a lawyer that he's, you know, at least, or she has had some exposure to the latest developments and, you know, can wrap around, um, you know, changes in the law. Um, and the only way to do that is the training. That's why CLE is so important, not only to the lawyers, but to the public. See, I was involved in continuing legal education, CLE, uh, since 1977. I went up to the law school to teach, and you know, I kind of left my uh, private practice of law, and I went up there to teach a, a first-year course, and more specifically, to set up the Hawaii Institute for Continuing Legal Education. And so I ran and operated that institute for let's see, about five years, and uh, developed all these different uh, courses, developed uh, little, what I call manuals, and uh, uh, so let's assume I did a, a a seminar on collection law. I was there. And you were. That's <laughs> right. I was going to say, and you were a panelist, and so we created a, a little handout which had forms in it and little explanations. And the attorneys loved it because I knew from private practice that a lot of attorneys knew how to uh, file a complaint or, or uh, uh, submit an answer. But after they got a judgment, they were a little fuzzy on how to collect it. And remember, we, we spent time on garnishment, attachment, execution, and we had forms, and that was a big hit. I, I remember that that first seminar. That was really, really great. But it was so bread and butter is what it was. It's all bread and butter. Real estate transactions, uh, um, and uh, divorce law, how to draft a will and trust. You know all those basic things that uh, a solo practitioner, especially or a small firm, needed to know. So that's what I concentrated on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Hickel, Hawaii Institute for CLE, uh, really became uh, self-supporting. And uh, then after five years, I left uh, to, I still love you know, education, but I left to work for uh, then Congressman C. Seftel and uh, for just a little over two years. And then after that, I started lobbying just by chance and uh, in 1984. So I started lobbying for the trial lawyers. And uh, then I 
formed Pacific Law Institute at the same time, so I could continue doing seminars because I really enjoyed the education part of it, you know. Well, you're and, a hands-on yeah. educator. I mean, you know, you know, a lot of these organizations, but like from the mainland, you know, they'll say, "Go talk about torts." Uh, you're oh, yeah. you're, you're going to get it, you know, down there, and you're going to tell them what in torts to talk about and what points oh, to yeah. cover, what issues to you know address. And this is very yes. valuable because at the end of the day, it's a much better program that way. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, uh, Jay, you know, I developed a program. I talk to the panelists I choose, get their input. But I have, you know, uh, I always consider myself a jack of all trades, master of none in the <laughs> law. And so I have all these experts, you know, telling me certain things. And then I formulate the program, create the program. And then I do a script, you know, by time. And I'm the moderator, so I follow the script. They can follow it, but it's meant as a guideline, not a real tightly controlled type of, uh, of presentation. And so that works because I, I have to go back a little bit, a little war story. One of the first uh, seminars I did was on divorce law in, and when I was at the law school at Hickel. And I had some of the best divorce attorneys on the panel. And I said, we need to do a rehearsal. <laughs> I actually did a rehearsal with one of the law students videotaping so they could see how they perform. Yeah. You know, that I had a little more time, I think, at that time. Anyway, I said, you know, we, we need to spend a little time on jurisdiction and venue. You know what that is anyway. And and the the panelists, the experts says, no, we don't need to do that. I said, well, believe me, it would be good to spend a little time on that because we don't know who's going to be watching uh, live. And, you know, it's important. That's a basic step one. Well, the panelists couldn't agree on, on the law. <laughs> and that was so funny. So the, so the law student, you know, was I knew, uh, I said, turn the camera off because they're arguing up there as to what the law was. And I said to myself, you know, that this is a va very valuable lesson to, uh, you know, I felt like at least I was on the right track anyway. That was, that was kind of fun. Today. But yeah, but you've been right, through really... the wars on so many programs, Bob. I mean, oh, everybody. Yeah. yeah. And it was a lot of it was in Waikiki hotels for a long time and other yeah. venues, but but now you know it's different now and it's you know it all was revealed to me anyway in that arbitration program a few weeks ago how much you can do with oh, yeah. with with guests uh, experts that are all over the state who never even have to stand up to appear it's easier. You you know moving forward and, and Jay you and I have well, I've talked to you a little bit about it. Uh, I'd like to do some other uh, courses, not only for attorneys, but for the public, you know, as a public service. And uh, I think that, you know, I have enough background in certain areas that I could moderate it and I create the program anyway. So uh, in March of next year, I think about doing a legislative update at the midpoint you know, to inform the public of what's out there, what's on the table, what could pass, what will not pass, you know, what is the state of the, the uh, financial uh, condition of the state, and I'll, I'll get the best uh, legislators to be on the panel. And then at the end of the session in May, maybe I'll do a, a wrap up. It doesn't have to be long, it could be an hour or hour half at the most. Mm -hmm. You know, and I use legislators and I and they, they're the ones that talk. I'll lead them on. So those are some of the things that I think about. And one of the things I've always been interested in, Jay, is climate change for a long time. And, uh, you know, I dealt with uh, Ford Fujigami, who was uh, the chief of staff at one point for Governor Ige. Mm -hmm. and was the director of the Department of Transportation mm -hmm. and just a, a very knowledgeable person and, and mm -hmm. very uh, a, a doer. He, he gets so he and I talked about 
climate change a little bit because of the roads. I asked them, what's going to happen to the roads? And, you know, we had a, just an open discussion and, you know, the question came up whether the roads have to be moved at one point. You know, I'm talking about the North Shore, especially. Yeah. And, you know, that's a serious issue because of the cost involved. And some people feel even Kalana Onoali Highway going to Hawaii Kai, depending upon which year we're talking about, 40 years from now, the water may come right up to the road. Yep. You know, who knows, right? Yeah, but, but I mean, so I, you I know, the public it. may not be fully apprised. The public may not realize this will affect them and their property. And so a discussion, a public discussion over this issue is very important. Uh, and well, it yeah. is ultimately a matter of law. And I think that if the public is aware, then they will ask the legislature and, and the administration, hey, you better do something about this, you know? And because it's happening, uh, it just is happening. And, and, but that's one area that, you know, I kind of like to do a, a hour half program on getting experts and you can get experts from the mainland. Sure, they don't have to stand up either. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, you're but, connected to all these judges and law school deans and professors all over the country, Bob. I mean, these, these years have, um, have connected you everywhere. And uh, it strikes me that if you want to do a program with national experts on, on issues that are either local where we can learn from other places or national issues that we should learn from other places, um, we can do that. You can do that because of your you know, your familiarity with not only the issues, but the people. Yeah, and you know, Jay, I'm, I'm still a, a commissioner on the Uniform Law Commission. I'm a life member now. Mm -hmm. And um, there, there's a wealth of, of talent in that conference, in that uh, Uniform Law Commission. Uh, attorneys, academics, judges, you know, are from different states. And uh, one, one person I always wanted to bring here uh, is Robert Stein, who was uh, Dean of the University of Minnesota School of Law and um, also was the executive director of the American Bar Association for many, many years. And is just such a talented, smart, brilliant guy. And he has the course on the great cases that were decided by the Supreme Court going way back to the present time. And uh, he's, I've listened to his course because he, he did a couple hours at our annual conference and it was just so fascinating. So I, I never could get him out here, excuse me, I never could get him out here, Jay, because he's so busy. You know, he goes to Europe, he goes here, he lectures all over the place. He's, he's uh, uh, familiar with uh, several United States Supreme Court justices and um, anyway. So it's, it's, uh, it's really terrific. And a long, long time ago, I dealt with Professor Larry Tribe from Harvard. I remember. And, you know, like, you remember? He's an and, and incredible he's, lawyer. Oh, just an amazing guy. And so like, these are some of the, the, the people that uh, we now can hopefully get because they, they don't have to necessarily fly here, although they would like to, you know, uh, yeah. to do to a program. Well, you know, I was thinking uh, of uh, John Drubinsky, who was on our three digit program a few years ago, that, that is uh, lawyers who had bar numbers of less than a thousand, you know, the older generation. And one of them was uh, John Drubinsky, who, who has passed since. And his thing was, uh, gee whiz, if, if the Supreme Court of the state or the United States Supreme Court, you know, uh, makes a decision, we ought to have a public discussion of that. Um, is it good? Is it bad? How did they reason it? What's the result? What's the effect? Uh, very valuable discussions. And, and although we get some of that in the press, we never get drilled down in the press. And so um, unless you read professional journals. And so uh, one, of, you know, one of the things um, that I'm hoping you will do um, is, is have panels of these you know, high level lawyers like Larry Tribe or uh, any number of law school deans and professors around the country 
who can speak to the national issues, can speak to cases that are decided in, you know, in appellate courts on the mainland and educate our people here and elsewhere um, exa exactly how the law is doing these days. I think I call that uh, what CPLE, continuing public legal education. <laughs> but, yeah, Jay, that would be a very interesting series. Uh, you don't have to do it every month. You can do it once a quarter, even four times a year, because as the cases come out by the Hawaii State Supreme Court or even the Intermediate Court of Appeals, yeah. uh, you could pick one case or two and uh, have a discussion on them and uh, the, the policy impact and why the court decided it that way. It'd be, it'd be very interesting for lawyers. And that actually, lawyers would, uh, I think, log on, especially if uh, uh, we gave them credit, CLE credit for that. What about non-lawyers? Um, if you have a CLE program, continuing legal education ostensibly for lawyers, and I'm not a lawyer, maybe a, an aspiring lawyer, um, you know, either a law student or a student of a student of the law, sort of thing. Can I come too? Sure. Oh yeah, you can log on. Uh, the only time that there's any restriction because of the nature of the program, the court index arbitration program trainings that we did are only for arbitrators, not not for the uh, general legal population. But let's assume I did a course on wills and trusts. Right? Doesn't have to be for lawyers. Uh, it could be for the general public. And, and um, you know, say take auto insurance. A lot of people don't understand auto insurance. You know, the different parts, what you should get, what you should definitely get and why it's important. And, you know, that would be a public, public course. But if, it, if I do it for free, right? And an, an, an attorney wants to, uh, uh, log on, that's fine too. Because a yeah. lot of attorneys may not know either. Yeah, well, we live in a, a complex society. It's more complex all the time. And, uh, you know, given the changes in our national government and the changes in, in Congress, the changes in the state legislature, we're going to see more dynamic all the time. And the average person really has to follow that. Because at the end of the day, it means dollars and cents and and quality of life and all that. We all have to be interested in what government is doing um, and what the law is doing and how it's changing. So I think there's a huge amount of material out there for you, Bob. And I think oh, a yeah. lot of people are motivated so. to know about it. Yeah. 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 Well, Jay, I think we're probably close to the end. I wanna thank you for having me on to just expound a little bit on Pacific Law Institute. And I'm looking forward to doing the seminars that are coming up and many more seminars and public forums, so to speak, in 2021. Well, Bob, we're delighted that you're working with us. We're delighted to have you on our shows and, and cover your seminars and educational programs. On the other hand, I've been uh, a, a student of your programs uh, since the 70s. <laughs> so. Nothing, nothing has changed. You, you have a way of looking at things. You have a way of teaching. You have a special skill. Um, and I think it's very valuable to the community. And um, I, I just want to compliment you on your, on your interest in educating people and your skill in doing that. Not only lawyers, but judges, legislators, and the whole community. And you are the center man. Thank you, Bob. Bob Toyofuku, the founder, president, and, and, and the leader of Pacific Law Institute. Thank you so much for coming on. I hope oh, to see no you. Problem. I know I'll see you soon. Yes, thanks a lot, Jay. <laughs> Aloha.